so we're done with the um, Bellman equation, and uh, which is probably means that the next few lectures are going to be easy for you guys since I think the hard stuff is done. Um, but before I tell you guys about uh, classification, which is the next three lectures, do you have any thoughts about the Bellman equation that I can help you with? Okay, well, you have a homework uh, uh, with signal dependent noise, I think, today. Uh, maybe on Monday you'll have some questions about it. Um, I, uh, I want to spend some time talking about classification. It's just the basics of classification, thinking about how to uh, do uh, some of the techniques that uh, are fairly common. Today we're going to cover Fisher discriminant analysis, which is useful from the point of view of thinking about how to optimize cost functions that are that are not easy to find the derivatives for. So you'll see a special kind of a cost function, one where what you want to do is take the uh, mean of two samples and make the means as far apart as possible weighted by the variance. You want to make the variance as small as possible and you want to make the means as far away as possible so you can classify these two things. And so Fisher discriminant analysis is a way of doing it. But the mathematics involved in maximizing this distance while minimizing the variance is a little bit interesting and so it's worthwhile looking at because it's an example of a cost function which for which there is a closed form solution but not through the derivative approach which is what we've been doing. So that's one of the things that is worth knowing how to do. The second thing that I want to show you is Bayesian classification. It's just sort of the beginnings of Bayesian classification which is basically the idea that you're going to have a likelihood function, you're going to have a prior and then from the likelihood and the prior, you're going to formulate a posterior probability. And we're going to talk a little bit about things like your uncertainty associated with that probability distribution. So you make a classification. How sure are you that this classification is, you know, good? And error rates associated with your um, classification. So um, let's begin with um, a simple classification problem where you've been given some data and the data is labeled so you have x vector which tells you you know the features of the, the space and then you have a label associated with it that tells you the class and from that you're going to build a model and you know we're going to build a linear model and uh, the, the, the natural approach initially is to just use regression which is to say basically well I have all this data x and the label for it and I just want to build a model that, that says well predict the, the class based on a weighted combination of the features. And if we use regression to do it, then w w what we'll see is that the problem that comes about is that um, if we look at the, our, our, the distribution of our errors in our estimation, so you know, when you use regression, what you end up with is saying that for this feature, you're going to belong to class 0 or 1, but you're going to get a real number like 0 0.3 or 0 0.8 or something if you use regression. And so you can say, all right, anything above 0.5, I'm going to say class 1. Anything below 0.5, I'm going to say class 0. But the problem is that if you use regression to do classification, then what happens is that the errors that you have in estimation, the difference between the truth and your prediction, these errors, are not going to have a distribution that's Gaussian, which is the basis of our assumption of saying that, you know, we make a prediction, we make an observation, the difference between those two is just noise. And noise has certain properties, it's supposed to be Gaussian with a mean and variance that are independent from each other. So we'll see that if we use regression to do it, then what we're going to end up with is a error distribution where the variance depends on the mean. And that's going to become a signal dependent problem. And so regression becomes not a good, good way to go. So then we'll use um, uh, other approaches. Fisher discriminant is the first thing that I'll show you. And then next I'll show you uh, a, uh, a simple approach using Bayesian. So um, we have a feature x that we've been given. So this is a vector, and, and you know, we're going to classify it into either belonging to class 0 or class 1, and the data is you know, x1, and uh, so this is y, either class 0 or class 1, and we have y1, and we have second data point, and we have its label, and so forth. And so what we can do is uh, you know, build a model that says my prediction is going to be equal to some weighted combination of these features. And um, I can write this in matrix form where 
x is going to be equal to 1, the first element of the x vector, the second element of the x vector, 1, the first element of the x vector, the second element, and then my weight vector w is going to be um, uh, uh, w1 through as many as uh, whatever number of x's that I have. Oh, sorry, start with w is 0. Yeah. Right, so x times w, 1 times w plus x's times the w gives you this vector, this, this representation. So I can find my maximum likelihood rep, uh, uh, of w hat. Maximum likelihood is going to be x transpose x minus 1 x times y. So um, using regression, we can find our, uh, our set of weights. Now, when we do this, what, what happens? So suppose we have a scenario that looks like this. We have some data points. And we have two classes. And what we're going to do is we're going to use so this is x1, this is x2, and each one of these data points is an, I an instance where we've collected uh, one, of these, one of these guys here, and the color is whether it belongs to class 0 or class 1, right? So that's, that's the data. So if you use regression to do the classification, what you're going to end up with is a line that separates these two classes and um, the equation for this line is going to be equal to 0 0.5 is equal to w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2. That's going to be the equation for that line. And your line is the bounded, the, the, the boundary that separates these two classes. And w0, w1, w2 are going to be what comes out of this, this representation. All right, so that's fine, you know. You know, this is okay. Now, but the problem is that, let, let's take another example. Let me show you what happens when you use regression to try to find these variables. So suppose that, suppose that I have a data set that looks like this. So I have one group that I have a few data points with small variance, and I have another group that I have few data points but with large variance. What's going to happen is that when you use a regression to find the decision boundary, you're going to find a decision boundary, you know, like before, someplace out here. But then if you, if you plot the line for 1 is equal to w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2, you're going to find that there are some data points that are, you know, outside of your class, if you will. They're beyond 1. And there's going to be a lot of data points actually outside of one. So it's kind of strange. What does this mean? You know, you, you, you use a regression to try to estimate, and you don't get either belong to class 0 or class 1. You get this continuum. And this particularly uh, happens when these variances are unequal. So um, let me show you the, the, the sort of the, the root cause of the problem. Suppose that on every trial, i, we define the error, which is the difference between the true class minus our estimate. And we're going to use regression to, to do it. So, you know, we have some probability of uh, uh, the class being 1 given x. And, you know, say this is theta, some, some number that tells us the probability for, you know, x is this. What's the probability of being equal, being a class, class 1? Say this is, this is theta, and of course the probability of y being class 0 given x is, is 1 minus theta. So um, let's ask, what's the expected value of, uh, of y given x? Well, that's um, the probability of y equal to 1 
given x times 1, plus the probability of y is equal to 0 given x times 0, right? This is the two, two instances of y. It either can be 0 or 1. And what's the probability for that? So these are the two probabilities, and this is equal to theta. What's uh, the expected value of y squared given x? That's equal to the probability of y equal to 1 given x times 1 squared times the probability of y equal to 0 given x times 0 squared. That's just equal to theta again. All right, that's just this. So what's the variance of y given x? That's equal to the expected value of y squared given x um, minus the expected value of y given x quantity squared, which uh, is um, equal to theta minus theta squared, which is theta times 1 minus theta. So why, why is it that I'm interested in variance of y? Because the variance of epsilon is going to be equal to my variance of y given x. And we see that this variance depends on the mean. So the variance of my error depends on the mean of y. It's not independent of y. So that's a problem. And it's a problem that we can't fix if we're going to use regression. So um, the way to approach it is what uh, uh, one of the ways that people have used in, in uh, frequentist approach. So frequentist approach is using things where we're going to maximize likelihoods and so forth. It's something that's called Fisher discriminant analysis. And let me show you what that is. So um, the idea is that when you take a data set and you project it, so let, let me do it on, 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 this, on this example here. So when I find a linear function like this to represent the data, effectively what I'm doing is that I'm, I'm fitting some line to my data, and then I'm looking for the distribution of the projections of those data points onto this line. So if you look at these blue dots here, and you project it, each one of them, to this line, what you're going to get is a distribution. It looks like this. And if you do the red ones, you get a distribution that looks like this. So when you fit your data to these linear models, you're projecting them onto some line. And that projection is going to end up having a distribution associated with this W transpose x. And what you want is that you want to make the mean of the distribution of one of the classes as far away from the mean of the distribution of the other class. So for example, if I, if I have this data like this, let, let, me, let me pick another line. So I have my data points. Something like this. And now if I, pick, if I pick a line that looks like this, then what happens is that if I project my data points to this line, what I'm going to get is some, some distribution that looks like this. And you notice that this has a greater overlap, and the centers are closer to each other than, than this one. So in some sense, this is a better way of separating my data than this. And so what, what Fisher discriminant analysis does is basically find the equation for this line so that when you take your data and you project it onto it, they, the classes are as far apart as possible. Now, it's, just, it's not good enough by itself to these means to be as far away as possible. What you also you want is that the distribution itself should be as tight as possible. So the means should be far, but the variances should be small. So that's what discriminant analysis is. It's defining this w so that it takes 
the means of the data and makes them as far apart as possible. So Fisher discriminant analysis. So what does that look like? So what we want is that we have some, some class, call it y0, where we have um, n1, well, I guess n0, sure, n0 data points. And there's a mean mu0 associated with it. So, so what, what I mean by this mean is that that's just a, that's, this is a vector, which is the sum of, um, uh, um, oh, sorry, 1 over n. I need to put 1 over n in the front of it. I belong to um, class 0 of x of i. So the mean of my data is a vector which basically represents the mean of my data that belongs to class 0. Okay, that's what I mean by mu 0. And I also have some variance, sigma, associated with that data, which uh, is going to be um, the difference, the, it's going to be the sum uh, of 1 over n0 minus 1 times um, um, x of i minus mu of i transpose. I belong to class 0. So I have some data that's labeled, like the data there, the blue. Each point is a vector. I find the mean of that vector, and I find the variance of that vector. OK? That's what sigma 0 and uh, mu 0 is. And similarly, I have class 1, where I have n1 data points, where mu 1 Sorry. OK. So all the data points that belong to each class, we find the mean and the variance. OK? All right. So what Fisher says is that what you want to do is find the vector w so that after you project your data onto this vector, so basically um, you, you have this model that says y hat is equal to w0 plus w transpose times x. This is my model. And, and you know, what, what I want is find this vector w so that um, I can make the centers after I've projected my data as far apart as possible between these two classes. So um, the expected value of y hat, given that uh, x belongs to class 0, is going to be equal to w0 plus the mean of x, w transpose mu0 and uh, variance of y hat given that x belongs to class 0 is going to be equal to um, the variance of x. So it's just going to be um, w transpose sigma 0 w. So this is the mean of my data when it's projected onto this line, right? And this is going to be the variance of that data when it's projected onto this line. So here's my, when I, when, I, when I take my x and I multiply it by this w, I'm projecting it someplace. And that projection is going to have a mean and it's going to have a variance. Yeah? Um, sigma equations are, so x and mu are also, they're vectors in that? Yeah. When you have yeah. more than one dimension. Yeah, 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 
exactly. I just shouldn't put the, this thing under it. Yeah. But, but that's, what you, that's what I mean. So this is a matrix. Sigma is a matrix. This is a, this is a number. This is a scalar. OK. So all right, so this is when I project things. And um, you know, similarly, the expected value of y hat, given that x belongs to class 1, is just going to be w0 plus w transpose mu1. And its variance is going to be w transpose sigma 1w. All right, so what, what Fisher says is that you want to find the w that maximizes a function. And that function is going to be the difference between the two means of the projected data, which is um, w transpose mu1 uh, or mu0 minus w transpose mu1. You want to take this and make it as far apart as possible. Let me write it for the, pur for the purpose of, of course, it doesn't matter if I write it this way or this way, right? It means the same thing. I want to make those as far apart as possible. And what I want to do is uh, make the variances as small as possible. So that's going to be um, one over n zero times um, um, w transpose sigma zero w plus one over n one w transpose sigma zero w. Sorry, sigma one. Weighted by the uh, not one over by just an n zero and n one. So depending on how many data points you have, this is saying that you know if I have a whole lot of data points that belong to class 0, then this matters more than this one. OK? All right. So what we want to do is maximize this ratio. OK. And it's interesting to ask, how does one do that? You know, how does one find a w? that maximizes the scalar quantity. And I want to show you a little trick that helps us do it. So obviously, you know, this is different than everything else we've seen so far because our cost function is not linear in W. Right? So you know, I, I have this nonlinear function of W here. And when I find this derivative, it's not going to be very simple for me to maximize things. So finding a derivative and maximizing it is not going to work. So a, a better way to do it is as follows. Let's, let me simplify this and, uh, um, and, and, and write it as follows. So I'm going to call um, uh, the difference between the means. So let's do mu0 transpose minus mu1 transpose. Um, I'm going to put it together like this. I'm going to put a w here, the square. So that's fine. I didn't do anything interesting. Let me bring the w's out and from the bottom as well. Like this. And let me call um, this difference here uh, m. So let me define m as the difference between the means. So this is going to be equal to m transpose w squared just a scalar quantity. Down here, let me define a matrix S to be equal to n0 sigma 0 plus n1 sigma 1. So these are variance covariance matrices. This is going to be a positive definite uh, symmetric matrix. So this is going to be equal to W transpose SW. All right, so we have a W in the numerator, and we have a W also in the denominator. And the question is, can we uh, represent this 
in a way that we can easily maximize our vector. And the idea is as follows. Let's say I write, so this is, this is how S is defined. I can always take my S matrix and write it in terms of two, um, a multiplication of two matrices. And this, this is, um, um, uh, these are called the square root matrices. Basically, R is in a way the square, square root of X, uh, the square root of S. So there exists some matrix R that I can write S as R transpose R. So that means that I can write this as MTW squared W transpose R transpose RW. All right, so that, that doesn't seem very interesting so far. Let's now see if we can represent W in such a way that uh, we can get rid of the R's in the denominator. So suppose I introduce a vector V that's going to be equal to R times W. So some new, I'm going to project W through R to, be, to, to make some vector V. So let's see what happens. So if I do that, what I have is that W, of course, is equal to R minus 1 V. See what happens in the denominator now. I have W transpose, which is V transpose R minus 1 transpose times R transpose times R times W, which is R minus 1 V. Which is going to be equal to This cancels, this cancels, I get V V transpose V. All right, so what's V transpose V? Well, that's just, this is the magnitude of V squared, right? So what I just end up doing is that represent V now in terms of a normalized vector, V divided by its, its uh, magnitude. So this is another vector here. This is just a scalar, this is just a vector quantity that's being multiplied by this. To, just to, to make it a little bit easier for us to see it, let me write it like this. Instead of writing as MT R trans R minus 1, I'm going to write it as R minus 1 transpose M transpose times V because that's the same thing. This is, this is the same thing as this. So this is a multiplication of two vectors. A vector times another one. A vector transpose times, times another vector. So what I want to do is maximize this projection. And so the way I do it is by making sure that this is in the same direction as this, uh, uh, this quantity V. So um, so the vector V that maximizes this quantity here is equal to some vector that's in the same direction. I'm going to put an A here, which is some, some arbitrary scalar, times um, that R minus 1 transpose times M. That's the vector V that maximizes this quantity. 
It's a projection of two vectors, right? So when v is in the same direction as this, the projection is going to be as large as possible. So that's, just, that's, that's v. So what's w? This is equal to a r minus 1t. What's m? m is um, mu 0 minus mu 1. Um, what's w? w is equal to r minus 1 times v. So um, that's equal to a r minus 1 r minus 1 transpose times mu 0 minus mu 1. Um, this, this is equal to a r um, transpose r minus 1 mu 0 minus mu 1, um, which is equal to r transpose r is just s. which is uh, equal to, A is arbitrary, so let me just set it equal to 1. S, um, S minus 1, S is the sum of the two variances. It's going to be 1 over um, N0 sigma 0 plus N1 sigma 1 times mu 0 minus mu 1. Um, and this is going to be an inverse, not a 1 over. So the w that maximizes the distance on the projections is going to be one that is the difference in the means divided by the sum of the variances. So that's w. Now, we, we had a, our model was a little bit more complicated than that. Our model also had a um, um, w0, right? So this was our model. I just found w for you. What about w0? w0 is going to be is going to be the difference between the um, expected value of y minus w transpose x, which is um, 1 over n times the sum of uh, y over i minus w transpose i. So you use this w equation to find the, um, uh, the Fisher uh, w and then the difference between that and the observation y is going to give you w0. That's going to be the, the Fisher discriminant model. And what it does is maximizes a particular cost. That cost is, um, is this. So what we did is that we found the W that took the data points and after they were projected onto some space described by this W, we got the means as far away as possible and the variance is as small as possible. The sum of the two variances. That's what the cost did. Okay. All right. So, so yeah. Just to so this, really what this is kind of doing is like you're taking the axis between the two means and then sort of rotating it by axis. a factor that represents like the skewness of the variances of the two clouds, basically. Axis between the two means. What like mean? mu, like the, the difference. The two means, the difference in the means. means. Give you, like if you just use that term, then it would just take a line going between the two, the means of the two clouds. Mm -hmm. And so the matrix that you're adding on the front of it is like a rotation matrix that sort of good like point. rotates that axis to accommodate for the skewness of the variance. That's a good point. Nice, nice, nicely put it. Yeah, yeah. The first one is like a rotation of the, the axis of the mean. Yeah, good point. 
I like that. I hadn't thought about that geometric interpretation. Nice. All right, let me now show you um, a different way of classifying, a more, um, uh, so this is a frequentist approach. Let us use a Bayesian approach. And you know, in the Bayesian approach, what we assume is that when we get data like that, we can form a likelihood function, and from the data, we can also formulate a prior. So if based on that, we can then compute the Bayes probability, the posterior probability. And the, the point is to show you a simple ideas about that with regard to um, what the shape of the function looks like, the posterior probability, and also what the uncertainty about your classification looks like when the variances are equal or unequal. And so let's do some examples of this to get a sense of it. So uh, Bayes classification. So our data is labeled comes as follows x1 y1 well this is a vector where y belongs to some class 0 or 1 let's write it as a set So um, when, when we formulate the problem as a base classification, what we have is um, uh, a probability of uh, having our class y being equal to, say, class 1, given that uh, we have some x. And that's, of course, the probability distribution of x given that I'm class 1 times the prior probability of being in class 1 divided by the marginal which is just the probability of x and this probability of x is going to be equal to the, um, the, the, the sum of the, the two probabilities associated with probability of x given that y is equal to 1 um, times the probability of y is equal to 1 plus the probability of x given that y is equal to 0 times the probability of y equal to 0. So this is the marginal, this is our likelihood, this is our prior. Okay, all right, so let's do a simple classification. Suppose that my data set is height, so we have some height of individuals and we want to classify them as being male or female. So, you know, maybe I'm going to say 0 and 1 represents our female and male representation. So if it's class this, if it's 1, we're going to call it the male. And, and so we, let's begin with our, our, uh, uh, um, our likelihood. So maybe probability of x given that you are male. So here's height. And you have probability of particular height given that you're a male. Maybe it looks like this. And then you also have probability of height given that you're a female. And you know the mean is going to be, as we know, something smaller. And if the two variances are equal, so suppose that the two variances of our likelihood function are equal, then what's going to happen is that um, th these are, so these are my probability of x given that y is equal to 1, probability of x given that y is equal to 0. So wh what am I doing? I'm multiplying this times a prior probability. So say that my equal, I have equal likelihood of having a male and a female. So this just gets multiplied by some number, 0.5 in this case. And then what I'm going to do is that divided by this quantity here, which is probability of y given x. Well, this is just the sum of these two things times the prior probability. So the p of x is going to look like something like this. Right? This is sum of those two multiplied by the prior probabilities. All right. So now if I divide this quantity by this, what I'm going to get is 
if I take this red one and I divide it by this blue down here, I'm going to get a function that looks like this. If I take the blue and divide it by this, I'm going to get a function that looks like this. And this is now the probability of male given a particular height. And you notice that the place where these two cross, this is your decision boundary, where these two lines cross, this is going to become your decision boundary. And this decision boundary is going to be the same place as this. And so in principle, what you want to know, your decision boundary is where the ratio of the probability of x given y is equal to 0 times the prior probability of y is equal to 0 this is the location where this is equal to 1 and the numerator and denominator are equal to each other in this case that's your decision boundary i don't know where i am on the other hand if the numerator is bigger than the denominator, then I'm going to be in class 0. If the denominator is bigger than the numerator, then I'm going to be in class 1. My decision boundary is when those two, two probabilities are the same. So that's, that's pretty simple. Now let's not consider a condition where the variances are unequal. Do you have any questions about this so far? All right, that's pretty, pretty easy. Let, let's consider when the variances are unequal. So suppose my prior probability looks, sorry, my, my, my likelihoods look like this. So here's my height. That's, you know, x, the x variable. And suppose my males, I have some really, really wide distribution in the height of the males. I have some really short males and some really, really tall males. On the other hand, the females, Oh, like this. So I have much lower variance in the females as compared to the males. So what I'm plotting here is P of X all right so okay so what is the, the, um, the marginal probability? What does P of x look like? So suppose that, again, my prior probability is 0.5, so the equally likelihood. So I multiply these guys by 0.5, and I add them up. And you know, of course, what I'm going to get is in a long tail. So you notice that if you, if, you look at, if you look at this function, I have two decision boundaries now. Because if my height is bigger than this number here, I'm going to say that it's going to be a male. And if the height is less than this number, I'm going to say it's going to be a male. Mm -hmm. Only in between, I'm going to say it's going to be a female. So if I divide. So I'm now going to plot for you p of the probability of y is equal to male given x. It's going to look like this. This is the probability of y of 1 given x, and the probability of being female given x is going to look like this. So all I'm doing is plotting the 
um, the posterior probability. Prior probability, what what does that do? Yeah. yeah, if the if the priors are unequal, then the two get weighted by different numbers. So, if if the the prior probability of y is equal to one is large, say say you have ninety percent chance that what you're looking at is 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 a male, then what that means is that this thing gets pushed up, this gets pushed down because this gets multiplied by the prior probability before it gets divided by the, the um, uh, p of x, the marginal. So what the prior probability does is that it, it, can, it can increase the weight of this before you add it to this. You can, you can, it's, like, it's like multiplying it. It multiplies it by something and then it pushes down this guy if they're unequal. So it, it, what it does is that it basically it then makes this, if my prior probability is large for P of X given Y1, then what that does is that it makes my, my decision boundary come in because it's pushing up the blue line. All right. So uncertainty of my classifier. So this is, this is my posterior probabilities. So I can tell you that how probable it is that I'm in class one or I'm at class zero based on this posterior probability. But, but what about my uncertainty? So um, what I want to know is basically what's the variance associated with my estimate given x. So this is the probability of it, but what about the variance? And to give you intuition, you sort of, you sort of would guess that my uncertainty is going to be highest right around my decision boundary. So basically right around the place where the two probabilities are close to each other, that's going to be the place where I'm most uncertain. And then as I get closer to the edges, that's going to be the place where I'm most certain. So um, what, what, I, what I want to show you is how to compute that, that, posterior prob that, uh, that variance. That's your uncertainty about your classifier. And here's how we're going to do it. So, um, And, and let me show you what, what I mean by that. So I have a probability of y being equal to class i given x. That, that, that's why I just showed you how to compute it. And um, you know that, that probability, I can do it like this. And I get a distribution, p of y given x, which is going to be equal to two things. It's going to have this distribution is going to have two numbers. It's going to have a probability at y is equal to 1 given x, and a probability at y is equal to 0 given x. So that's what a distribution is. OK, so what is the variance of, my, this, of, 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 this, of this distribution? So I have an expected value of y given x, which is the probability of y is equal to 1 given x times 1 plus the probability of y is equal to 0 given x times 0. And you know this is going to be equal to just the probability of, of y is equal to 1 given x. That's the mean of my distribution. And then we have the expected value of y squared given x. That's going to be also equal to this. So the variance of my y given x is going to be equal to the probability of um, y is equal to 1 given x minus the probability of y is equal to 1 given x quantity squared. 
So if I were to plot this, this, this relationship, if I were to plot this number, probability of y being equal to 1 given x minus its value squared for these two things that I showed you here. So let's plot it for here. So I'm going to plot the variance of y given x, which is equal to this quantity, probability of y equal 1 given x, minus the probability of y equal 1 given x squared. I'm going to plot that as a function of x. What I'm going to see is that this function looks like this, where that's the decision boundary. It's going to have a maximum value right at the decision boundary. If I do it here, if I plot probability of y equal 1 given x minus the probability of y equal 1 given x squared, it's going to look like this. My uncertainty is going to be greatest right here. And that's basically the variance of y given x. That's my uncertainty about my classification. All right. So what's going to be your error rate when you do, the, do your classification? OK, so the final topic, a little topic here your error rate. What do we mean by how good is your classifier? You can, you can, you can tell me this by looking at your um, misclassification. Let's look at this plot on top. So if I plot the, uh, the likelihoods multiplied by the priors, then the misclassification is going to be right here. So the, the area underneath this curve tells me the probability of picking class 0 when, in fact, it was class 1, or the opposite. So this area here, the sum of that area is going to be, this, this area from one side to the other is going to be the, um, my error uh, probability. So let me, let me write that down for you. So, um, well, maybe it's easier here. So this area here is going to be a range where it's going to tell me the integral of, let's call it R0, of P of uh, x given y is equal to 1 times the probability of y is equal to 1 dx. This, this area is um, the uh, when I'm going to make a mistake in classifying something, because I'm going to say, if, if I fall here, from here to here, if I fall from here to here, I'm going to, I'm going to say that belongs to you know, uh, uh, this red region, but in fact it belongs to the blue region, so I've misclassified it, plus R1 P of X given that Y is equal to 0 times the probability of Y is equal to 0 dx plus this region here. This is my error rate. Bayes error is going to be the sum of these two things because I misclassified my data. That's what this error rate is. What you do is you take your likelihood, p of x given that y is equal to 1, times the, the prior probability that y is equal to 1, and you integrate it over the region where you are classifying it as the other class, over R0. 
over that region, plus the other class that you have, p of x, given that y is equal to 0, times the probability of y is equal to 0, integrated over the region that you're calling it class 1. It's the area underneath those two curves, the blue and the um, a red curve, just to the adjacent to the decision boundary. So for this, the error rate is going to be as follows. So let's take the red curve. So the red curve is my, um, you know, how I made my decision. So I'm going to say here, when, I'm, when, I'm, when my height is over here, I'm going to say it's a male. When the height is over here, I'm going to say it's a male. When the height is here, I'm going to say I'm going to be a female. So my error rate has to do with this area here underneath the red, and it has to do with this area out here. That's when I misclassify, right? And then, in addition, I'm going to misclassify here when I'm blue. The sum of those three areas is my error rate. That's the error rate of your base classifier. OK. Uh, yeah. Can you repeat how we select uh, where to separate the regions? OK. So you have to know your decision boundary first. Uh, yes, well, the decision boundary comes where the ratio between the likelihood times the prior is equal. So what does this mean? OK. So. In this case, what I've, what I've drawn is the likelihood. So this is the likelihood of p of x given y is equal to 0 and the likelihood of p of x y is equal to 1. That's my likelihood function. Suppose that the, the prior probabilities are equal. If they're not equal, they're just scaling these. So, so you have prior probability and you have a likelihood, right? I've plotted the likelihood. OK, so when they're equal, you want to separate at this point. Say again? Yeah, so your decision boundary is going to be where, when they become equal. And of course, you want to pick the function that's larger. As soon as they cross each other, you want to pick the function that's larger. So in, in all of this condition, you're, you're, you know, so here you're going to pick the blue. Here you're going to pick the red. Here you're going to pick the blue. That's that because it gives you a higher posterior probability, right? Because so the posterior probability is just the division of these things by some, you know, constant. Here it is. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. All that matters is which one is bigger. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can't separate them. Oh, you saw that? Does not work. Because oh no 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 no. So no, this still works. This still works. So if you, if yes. you have if you have two means that are exactly the same, the second one works. The first one does not work. The, yeah, I can still use Bayes because let me let me show you. Let me show you. So because if I have here, here I can I can plot for you. Here here's here's one function. Right. Here's here's one likelihood, and here's another likelihood. Right, so they're exactly the same mean, right? But I can still do, do posterior probabilities, right? I can, I'm going to pick this one here. Here's my decision boundaries. This works. This doesn't work. Yeah. The numerator is going to become 0 in this one. Yeah. Good question. OK. Um, did you guys understand the error rate? So the error rate is going to be, for this function, is going to be 
this area right because that's the, I'm misclassifying things there and it's going to be this area the integral of those two things Good, and these are probabilities, right? So x can be a vector, I don't care. These are just probabilities described in many dimensional spaces, doesn't matter. All right, thank you so much.